uh, I have 50 minutes and I will try to to be as uh, comprehensive as possible in these 50 minutes on this, uh, these very important issues that are associated with the inflection point that uh, we are observing in the advanced economy now in terms of, uh, I would say, inflation, monetary policy as a way of consequence of inflation, and by way of consequence also the uh, financial environment of uh, advanced economy markets and global financial markets, of course. So let me say that I will try to respond to four questions and then conclude by some remarks or some advices. First question, what happened exactly between the great financial crisis, say Lehman Brothers crisis, and the start of the COVID crisis? What why did it created the strong belief that inflation was gone, that deflationary pressures were there to last forever, and uh, by a way of consequence, uh, that interest rates would be very low, extremely low, in a secular perspective, not only in a, I would say, conjunctural or cyclical perspective? First question. Second question What are the reasons why? we are observing since mid 2021 in the advanced economy and at a global level, a major inflection point in terms of inflation first, and then of course, in terms of uh, central bank response uh, to inflation and inflection point also, of course, on interest rates. This second question is the key question to understand what happens, what has happened as I said, since mid 2021, and what is happening today still. And it is essential to understand all the layers that are at stake in order to see what is secular and what is conjunctural, what is cyclical, say, to utilize this uh, dichotomy uh, in order to understand whether or not we are in a totally new situation in comparison with the 10, 12 years before this surge of inflation with a vengeance. Third question, not negligible, in retrospect, why was it difficult for public authorities to appreciate the amplitude of the inflation phenomenon and to take action, including in the domain of monetary policy? As I said, this is for the past, but some, I would say, lessons are to have to be drawn in terms of uh, uh, economy, in terms of the tools that are at the disposal of the economists. And fourth question, which is, of course, the key question seen from the market participants, uh, economists, uh, uh, political authorities, is the battle for going back to price stability likely to be won by central banks? It is what they say, it is what they affirm, uh, and uh, they, their determination is uh, again uh, confirmed in the present situation. Even I would say two days ago, one day ago, we could see what was the rhetoric of Jay Powell and of Christine Lagarde and of the other central bankers the world over. So what are the main challenges? And I'm, I am personally confident to, to go to what I trust, that in the medium run, we will be uh, in the major advanced economy and by way of consequence, uh, more or less at a global level, back to the pre, the ante uh, situation, namely back to price stability with a definition, and I will go back to that, which is, as you know, 2%, around 2% as a definition of price stability or as a goal, if you are in the, I would say, paradigm, paradigm of uh, inflation targeting. So first question, why inflation looks like having vanished? I think that uh, we had five main reasons to explain what was happening over the period uh, going from, uh, say, Lehman Brothers to oversimplify up to the start of the Lehman Brothers crisis. 
uh, I see five main reasons. Don't be surprised if I enumerate a number of causes or a, a number of reasons. Uh, again, I want to affirm the multi-dimensional, the multi-layered situation in which uh, we very often are, obviously, in economics and uh, where we were and are today. So I see five reasons. First, the legacy of the great financial crisis. The great financial crisis uh, was a very, very important uh, inflection point also in the advanced economy and in the global economy in terms of uh, growth potential significantly lower in the advanced economy after the great financial crisis. Productivity progress slowing down quite a lot. And of course, if you are in a universe of uh, slower growth and with a slower productivity gain, you are in a universe where it is not totally abnormal. At least it is one of the contribution to uh, abnormally low inflation. Second point, very, very important, acceleration of globalization. We were during these 10, 12 years I am mentioning in between the two crises, in a period of very, very formidable acceleration of globalization, generalization of uh, global supply chain at a global level. And of course, this, I would say, optimization at a global level of the division of labor has consequences in terms of being able to produce at lower costs and to sell, I would say, your production at a lower price. Second reason very important, also in comparison with what we are observing today now in terms of globalization. Third reasons, the famous uh, savings glut. Uh, ben Bernanke uh, underlined, and he was right to, to underline that, that we had at the global level, at the level of the global economy, obviously some documented, say, by many economists, some <clears throat> excess of savings <clears throat> comparing to investment at the global level and that of course was not only contributing to a, new, a universe of uh, relatively low inflation but also a universe of uh, low real interest rates because again of the excess of savings in comparison to investment at a global level this is not us this is not only the advanced economy it is a global observation fourth reasons very important also, also in comparison with what we're observing today. Very true in the US, but by way of consequence also true in many advanced economy, the weak negotiation power of labor, uh, which was particularly visible in the United States. Uh, bargaining power of labor, bargaining power of uh, AFL-CIO, of the organized labor, as well as labor in general, very low creating the sentiment that uh, the low, I, mean, I would say, the lower middle class was totally forgotten and neglected, that the uh, real wages and salaries were stagnating uh, in the US, particularly visible in the US, also visible in many advanced economy. I would say, en passant, not in France, for the French citizens that are there, in my, in my own understanding, because we are in a situation where the negotiating power of labor was never to be compared with the US or UK or some other advanced economy. Still, this fourth point is extremely important in my opinion. Don't forget, in, in accounting terms and on the long run, inflation is equal to unit labor cost. So the mixture of nominal wages and salaries augmentation and of course uh, productivity progress but 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 inflation equals unit labor cost is very important uh, economically in my opinion and then of course we had a, a, a fifth reasons which was uh, very cyclical obviously which was the covid epidemics which uh, was uh, was aggravating of course considerably the situation with uh, the threat of, uh, I would say, depression, 
and uh, the uh, aggravation of the danger of having a very, very low inflation. So combined, those four main reasons plus the COVID reasons or the fifth reasons explain why the central banks the world over, particularly in the advanced economy, we are considering, rightly so in my opinion, it was not my time, I could be perhaps uh, uh, more, uh, I would say, prudent and cautious on that, but I would say that considering that the main danger was the materialization of the deflationary risk was, uh, I would say, uh, true, it was really something which uh, the central banks had to cope with, and that's the reason why they were extremely accommodating. So we had during more or less 10 years an extremely accommodating monetary policy with uh, real and nominal interest rates very, very low. And as you all know, of course, uh, new <clears throat> non-conventional instruments being utilized very powerfully in all advanced economies, at least in all economies which had the breathing space, the room for maneuver, permitting to engage in this uh, extraordinary non-conventional measures. To give you only one element of my own experience, when I was uh, president of the ECB, I was the president in charge at the moment of the explosion of Lehman Brothers, of the subprime first, then Lehman Brothers. I had to take uh, immediate action, which was uh, particularly uh, difficult to take because uh, it called for uh, very rapid and swift decision-making processes. Then we had the crisis of the sovereign risk in Europe in 2010, the uh, Greek, Ireland and Portuguese uh, crisis. And uh, we decided at the time to engage for the first time in purchasing targeted segment of the bond market, the bond markets of the three countries that I just uh, mentioned, which was uh, very heavily criticized, considered a very abnormal uh, behavior for a central bank. Uh, and it was the first time that uh, we engage in this targeted uh, support of a number of countries uh, through their, uh, the purchase of their uh, treasuries. And then we had the same in 2011, the same but much graver because it was Spain and Italy, two of the four major countries in the European Union, in, uh, no, in, in the Euro area at the time. The UK was still in the European Union at the time, but uh, it was uh, something which uh, was, again, very heavily criticized and considered much too bold. So it's not because I did that myself and I was the first to do that, that I consider that the successors and that the US, Japan and the UK were right in engaging in these non-conventional, very, very important measures. I really consider that it was necessary because of the immediate danger of the risk of uh, materialization of deflation. And deflation, you, you know what it means. If you have prices that are on a secular basis starting to diminish, then of course, uh, all decision makers have a tendency to wait for the next price. And then uh, it is a contraction of both consumption and investment, which is the recipe, of course, for the shrinking, the total shrinking of the economy. So I try now to elaborate on the second question. Why inflation back? There I will propose you eight causes, probable causes, for uh, the reason why inflation is back. Some are cyclical. Some can be qualified as both, as both cyclical and secular. Others are, in my opinion, in my judgment, highly secular and therefore are paving the way for a situation which would in the future be very different from what we had observed in the past. <clears throat> first, the first cause, which is in my opinion cyclical, 
uh, and I hope at least that it will happen to be cyclical. It is the end of the COVID and the post-COVID recovery. It is the trigger of inflation. And that's the reason why I consider that depending on some month delay between the US and Europe, you can consider that mid-2021 is really the moment where you have the start of the uh, inflationary episode. What happened then? Very simple. Because it was the post-COVID recovery, you had a lot of money, which was uh, uh, very, uh, I would say, ready to, to be spent, and some consumption. Potential consumption was there before this recovery, but when the recovery was there, there was a fantastic demand fueled by the money which had been uh, saved, invested by the uh, fiscal policies that had been in the time of the COVID particularly accommodating, were accommodating also during the 10 years during which the materialization of the deflation was uh, the main danger perceived by the central banks, as I said, but also perceived by government. And on the supply side, you had all the legacy of the uh, difficulty which uh, came out of the uh, COVID period, uh, disorganization, disruption of the productive sector, disruption of the, uh, I would say, value chain at a global level, uh, and also the phenomenon which is still to be fully explored, but which was observed in many, many economies, namely a different attitude of labor, which uh, was creating additional element of supply difficulty. So you, you both had a supply shock, a negative supply shock, and you had a fantastic demand shock and inflation. So uh, we could go back to that in the question, and you, I'm sure that uh, uh, you, you will have a question on that. On that, it is very important, in my opinion, to recognize that the post-COVID recovery was the start of this episode. Second reason, cyclical, and I will go back to that, initial delay to react to the surge of inflation. Initial delay for the governments themselves that had a difficulty to accept that inflation was back. Initial delay uh, for uh, the central banks themselves. And we can document the delay for the central banks between the start of the recovery, uh, post recovery, uh, post COVID recovery, and uh, the beginning of the reaction of the central banks. Delay even to diagnose what was happening. Uh, Jay Powell, for instance, continued to say in uh, October 2021, uh, inflation is transitory. We are pretty confident that we will be back at 2% in 2022. To, to show confidence in the fact that inflation was really transitory. He changed tack <coughs> only the next month on, in November where he said, we trust that uh, inflation is not simply transitory. And the first interest rate increase, and I will go back to that, uh, took place in March 2022. So you see the delay, uh, five months, five, six months uh, uh, delay between the moment where uh, the diagnosis was wrong, then right, but uh, the uh, I would say, decision uh, accompanying the new diagnosis was quite late. And the same in Europe with a delay, which uh, we can explain, it seems to me, but which, of course, add to the difficulty of this period. But both in both cases, it is something which seems to me cyclical. As you know, and we will go back to that, the central banks had we are very keen on proving that they were speaking seriously that it was not it was not because they had it had taken a certain time to uh, develop their own right diagnosis that they were not trying to catch up and you know that both on both sides of the atlantic one can say that uh, it was the, the fastest increase of rates in their own history so uh, 
Uh, I turn to the third reason, uh, the third causes, which are, I mentioned en passant, because we could reflect for hours on that. The, not, not only, uh, I would say, the derivatives of the policies which were pursued at the, at the time of the diagnosis, uh, the right diagnosis of inflation, but all the stock, the stock of very accommodating fiscal policies that had been accumulated during all the past years, say to oversimplify the past 12 years in, in embracing also uh, what uh, was done in the time of the COVID, so extremely accommodating fiscal policies that of course uh, have a component which is uh, uh, important in terms of potential inflation. And the same for the monetary policy, the very accommodating monetary policies, conventional and non-conventional over the past 10, 12 years, were there also to uh, document something uh, like, uh, uh, I would say, potentially inflationary. I, I, uh, I would say it's both cyclical and secular. We have to take into account that at least the monetary policy were dramatically changed. And that, of course, you had this uh, stock, if I may. When I, I'm speaking of stock, you have to uh, get orders of magnitude in the four central banks of the advanced economies that are the major central banks of the economies and that are uh, issuing the currency that are in the basket of the SDR, the special drawing rights. So you have four currencies, namely the dollar, the euro, the yen, and the sterling. Those four central banks have accumulated something of the order of magnitude of 24 trillion euros or, or 24 trillion dollars, depending, of course, on the exchange rate between the two currencies, but an enormous amount unprecedented, unseen, enormous amount of inflation, if I may, in their balance sheet, namely, uh, mainly uh, treasuries, but also uh, a lot of outstanding in private uh, negotiable uh, uh, securities. So uh, that is there, and that is something, independently of the new policies that are now pursued, including in trying to, um, I would say, diminish progressively, slowly, and I will recommend that they would be as cautious and prudent as possible to diminish this enormous portfolio of 24 trillion I just mentioned. So you see cyclical post-COVID recovery initial delay, Bo complex uh, and uh, cyclical and secular, if you want absolutely to uh, to uh, sort uh, these causes, very stock of very accommodating fiscal policy, stock of very accommodating monetary policy. Now I have the three very important causes, which in my opinion are clearly of a secular nature, of a structural nature, that are the reversal in the globalization uh, phenomenon, second, the green transition, and third, the bargaining power of labor in the advanced economy. Uh, the reversal in the globalization phenomenon, the globalization trend, is something which is all the more important because we had the exactly contrary phenomenon, of course, during the period of very low inflation. What happened? In my understanding, but it is very well documented by academia on the one hand, and also by a, a lot of uh, speeches that are uh, done here and there, including in the major partners. And the major partners would include the US and, and China, for instance, and all advanced economy, including uh, the country in which uh, you are presently. COVID demonstrated that the global supply chain were highly depending on what could happen anywhere in the world. And even if what was happening was a global phenomenon, the COVID, it had a lot of consequences uh, in terms of the, those global supply chain, 
it drove the uh, attention of public opinion of, uh, I would say, uh, uh, political authorities of uh, all the private sector on the fact that you had to hedge against the possibility of your global supply chain to be interrupted, that you had to take that into consideration, not only for strategic reasons, not only as uh, appear to be the case uh, uh, for, uh, I would say, medicine, for instance, uh, drugs and so forth, uh, not to be dependent uh, on the outside world, which was particularly resented in some European countries uh, and in the US, but also uh, all taken into account because, because for your own business, for your own way of managing your company, you had to take that risk into account. Risk, the, the COVID was a, a kind of metaphor of all those underlying risks that could happen without uh, being anticipated. And on top of that, of course, you have not only uh, after the war in Ukraine, but before the war in Ukraine, all the rumors on new geostrategic positioning of a number of countries. Of course. China, US, of course, Russia and the environment of Russia. And of course, it's been fantastically accelerated and made uh, dramatic with the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, uh, with a lot of uh, immediate consequences already mentioned in terms of prices, of course, uh, amplification of the uh, formidable surge of prices in uh, energy and um, and uh, I would say aliment and um, uh, agro products. But uh, that phenomenon, I feel, in my own judgment, is really of a structural nature. The legislation in the US is now oriented on reshoring. And uh, that, that is something which is not only visible in technology or in key, I would say, component. Uh, or in terms of uh, military equipment, but in many other. And some are interpreting, right or wrong, the fact that the Chinese zero COVID policy was also as, a, I would say, way of consequence to suggest to the foreigners that were in the firms that they were associated with uh, through joint venture and so forth in China to get back to their country in order for uh, the country of China to be more free, freer of uh, less depending, if I may, of uh, the outside world. I mentioned that en passant. I don't buy that, but it seems to me that it is one of the anecdotes that we hear now. We did not hear that before that are, uh, I would say, suggesting that this reversal in the globalization trend is for real. It's a very serious thing, and it is long term more than for short term. Second of the secular structural reasons, green transition. The, we have to be aware of the presentation of the green transition, including by some, I would say, uh, academia, in academia. Uh, it's clear that we have to engage in a massive uh, surge of investment. Green investment have to be absolutely massive. I will spare you the trillions of euros or trillions of dollars that are at stake, but it's obvious that uh, when you are changing drastically all your production processes, it is very demanding in terms of investment. On top of that, you have to understand that a lot of former investments that are not necessarily part of the, I would say, surge of green investment become obsolete. And so that there is the stock of investment of the past is becoming drastically obsolete. Fancy that what was happening in the car industry and so forth. So we have there a formidable push 
of demand, not on the form of uh, consumer demand, but in, in the form of investment demand. And that, of course, normally should push up the uh, inflation, again, on a secular, long-term basis at a global level. At least it is clear that the theory of the savings glut that I already mentioned, uh, permitting to have as low as possible real interest rates, is no more, uh, I would say, valid if you have this extraordinary surge of investment. So the uh, excess of savings will be absorbed by this surge of investment. So I could elaborate much more on that, but I draw your attention to the fact that it is the second of the three important secular uh, cause of uh, the reason why inflation might be really back. Now, the bargaining power of labor. Third reason, which I consider as very, very important. I already mentioned that it was one of the reasons why we had no inflation, a very low inflation in the past in the advanced economy, at least in the US and in a large number of advanced economies, certainly in Japan. Uh, now, what, what's happening? Uh, in my opinion, what was uh, an economic problem, a real economic problem, because it has also a direct impact on inflation. It had also a direct impact on nominal inflation, if I may. It had a direct impact on the monetary policy of the central banks. It had a direct impact on the threat of uh, deflation. The, the economic problem emerged at the level of the politics. You can interpret, maybe uh, some of us uh, will, will know. I don't know whether US citizens are there, if they are US, US citizens, okay. So you might not be in full agreement with me, but I take it that uh, the emergence of Trump is a very significant from that standpoint, because the uh, guy that won the primary and then the election was defending the interest, at least visibly, of the blue collars and not of the big business. He was not defending, the inter at least in the rhetoric, not defending the interest of the big business. He was defending, pretended that he was defending the interest of the blue collar. And he was elected by the blue collar, obviously. And of course, the lessons has been fully <laughs> understood by the Democratic uh, Party. And uh, the sequence, Trump-Biden, looks very much like a dramatic change in the policy politics in the, in the US in terms of taking into account what I had I was qualifying as an economic problem beco becoming a major political problem and all the advanced economy at the moment I'm speaking and much more at a global level are mentioning the problem of inequalities the problem of uh, aberration associated with the level of inequalities that had been amplified uh, during the last years. So that drives me to the conclusion that the probability of the bargaining power of labor as low as it was in the past is very unlikely. And that, that would prevent us from having the nominal evolution of uh, wages and salaries on the one hand and unit labor costs on the other hand as low as it was in the past. So all these reasons, I am at my seven reasons. Huh? The, the three last say reversal in globalization, green transition, bargaining power of labor. All this is suggesting that we will be in the future I do. I will not say today, tomorrow, or the day after tomorrow, even if today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, we are trying to get back down to around 2%. But the fact is that uh, the inflationary pressures will be there in the future, which does not mean that I am telling you that we will have a very high level of inflation in the future, because I would say two major forces in our democracy will play out. One is the people. The people does not like inflation. And when you ask people, uh, and when you have a real level of inflation, it becomes the first political problem. So that, that counts. And the central banks, 
have the responsibility to provide price stability. So I take it that the decision will be taken. And when I say decisions will be taken, I'm thinking of both the central bank's policies and the policies pursued by the government themselves, namely not only their uh, fiscal policies, but also uh, their uh, structural policies and another uh, series of uh, other elements that are in the hands of the governments and on, not in the hands of the central bank. So I, I have to, you have to, to, to see the point. Major changes in the inflationary pressure, not necessarily materializing, because there are forces that will oppose that, including, of course, the central banks. The responsibility of the central banks is to deliver price stability to their, uh, I would say, fellow citizens. The, I said that I announced eight causes. The, the last one, of course, already mentioned is uh, war in Ukraine. War in Ukraine, which is going through many, many uh, channels. Uh, and of course, uh, is doing nothing but amplifying inflation, particularly in Europe, amplifying the drama of the situation, amplifying the absence of confidence that is associated with this will of uh, uh, many, many economic agents to hedge against the risk of uh, uh, interruption of their uh, global value chain and and and. So that was a first look at the reasons why inflation is back. And we are in this uh, uh, inflation episode, even if you could probably see that the last figure for Europe are inflation, all component of prices that are in the, in, in the methodology, 8.5, which is down from 9.2. 9.2 in December, 8.5 in January. But I draw your attention, and I said that publicly recently, that uh, uh, the underlying inflation, the core inflation, as we say, when you uh, get out of this uh, uh, inflation, 8.5, the energy and uh, food, you arrive to 5.2. And 5.2% inflation in Europe, in the euro area, is the same as last month. So we have a very strong diminishing of the headline inflation, 9.2 down to 8.5. And we have a stagnation as regards the underlying inflation. And of course, what counts is underlying inflation, because there are, uh, no authority is responsible for the price of oil and uh, gas, and etc. Uh, and particularly in Europe with uh, what happens uh, in, uh, in uh, Ukraine. But the reverberation of these prices on all other prices uh, is very, very important, of course. To give you the last figure in the US, we don't have yet the January figures in the US, so unless I'm misled. But um, uh, in December, the equivalent uh, uh, core inflation was 5.7. So you see, we, we have in the US and in Europe, more or less, that, that's something which is interesting to analyze, more or less the same core inflation. And uh, that, that, of course, has consequences in terms of uh, what happens uh, in uh, the, uh, I would say, uh, um, what could happen in terms of the monetary policy compared in the US and in Europe. In the US, uh, the core, as I said, was 5.7 in December, headline 6.5, headline in Europe 8.5 in January, headline in the US 6.5 in December. I will go back to that. Now I promise that I would also elaborate on the reason why authorities and central banks were late in reacting to the new uh, situation. How to explain the initial delay? Uh, I'm a little bit too systematic in mentioning authorities and central banks. 
I should say also all economists, all economists, and uh, I would say also all practically an overwhelming uh, proportion of uh, uh, market participants, investors and, and savers, consider that the inflation which was looming was transitory. I already mentioned the fact that uh, Jay Powell was definitive on that during a, a long period of time. And again, uh, this was shared, unfortunately, by, I would say, the other central banks, obviously. I see five reasons. I promise you <laughs> always a lot of reasons or causes or uh, uh, points to examine. It's always, always complex, multidimensional, multilayered. At the very beginning, there was something which was perfectly uh, legitimate, and it's the hesitation of the qualification of the phenomenon. Is it a pure supply shock, or is it a demand shock, or is it a complex uh, blend of demand and supply shock? I think it's very important because, of course, if you have a pure supply shock, uh, your instrument as a central bank is really to try to monitor demand. If you have no particular uh, danger coming from demand, uh, you have no particular reason uh, to uh, manipulate your own instruments because then you will only do something which would uh, slow down your own economy and maybe create damages. So it's normal to ask the question. The question was not, in my opinion, very legitimate in the US, where it was clear that it was a demand shock, uh, not only because of the, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, post-COVID supply, uh, demand shock, but also because you had a lot of extraordinarily expensive Sub, uh, fiscal policies that had been accumulated. I mentioned the accumulation over a long period of time, but you had also the new decisions of the new executive branch that uh, embark on piling up on what uh, Trump had already done. And that was creating something which was really alarming. The proof of the alarm was uh, Larry Summers, uh, Secretary of the Treasury of Clinton, Democrat, telling the president, you're going too far, you will create uh, an inflationary environment. Be cautious, your new fiscal policy is much too expensive. That was very courageous for, uh, for uh, Larry Summers uh, to say that, because again, he was directly criticizing the new uh, government. In Europe, it was more legitimate to uh, reflect on whether or not it was uh, supply or demand. And obviously in Europe, it was much less demand like, than in the US and much more supply than in the US. We see that today. I mentioned the last figure we have, 6.5 in the US, 8.5 here. And the same for more or less the same at the level of the uh, core inflation meaning that uh, we are touched much more in terms of the real economy of the of the, the what is uh, you know shocking hitting the real economy in terms of uh, i would say energy and uh, food and that's normal because the us is much more independent and self sufficient in this domain than what we are so we have really a different situation in comparison with the us but the first reason I mentioned, as I said, is a legitimate theoretical reason. It's normal to ask that. It's normal, perhaps, uh, that it takes a little more time to react. I consider that you can explain through such meditation on what exactly is happening. Uh, you can explain part of the delay of reaction of the European Central Banks in comparison with the Fed. Second reason. The belief in the mind of, I would say, most economists, market participants, investor savers, central banks, etc., that the structural no inflation, low inflation pressures already mentioned by me would go on 
the idea of many economists, they were wrong. And I was, uh, I considered it, a, it was a pity that so many economists were arguing that inflation was low forever, interest rates were low forever, and that by way of consequence, you had to do exactly as if it was really forever and draw all the appropriate behavior, including borrowing massively and so forth and so forth. Of course, when you have such a recommendation, it's agreeable music to many ears. And not surprisingly, it was said and repeated and so forth. It was plain wrong. We know now, of course, that it was plain wrong, but it played a role. That this conventional wisdom played a role in delaying the reaction. Another uh, element which is associated, all those elements, as you see, are intertwined. But it's true that to the extent that for the central banks, the main danger was the materialization of deflation. It was absolutely normal that they would invent uh, forward guidance, which was designed to mention to all, I would say, economic agents and market participants, trust us, we will continue to be as accommodating as possible for a very long period of time. I'm summing up what they were repeating in their uh, successive uh, meeting of the Open Market Committee or of the Council of Governors. That was justified in a former period, but when you are in a totally different period, that's the virtue of the inflection point. It's very difficult to make the U-turn. When you have said everybody that we will continue to be as accommodating as possible, to tell them, look, uh, well, <laughs> things have changed. Of course, you can always refer to Keynes. You know, <laughs> you you are accusing me of changing my mind. But when things are changing, what do you do yourself? Do you change your mind? That was exactly uh, what was happening. And they should have said, peut perhaps, quote Keynes and say, "Well, uh, we change our mind because we are in a different situation." But it was it's anyway difficult uh, when you are engaged yourself with the signature of the central bank in this uh, forward guidance. In any case, to do a U-turn when you are an institution and where, where, where you have a lot of interaction with your uh, environment, financial environment, uh, also your fellow citizens, it's difficult. There was uh, another additional delay that I have to mention because uh, after all, uh, you are uh, plunging in economies. And, and it's important to understand that from time to time, you have things that are neglected, but could play a role. I spoke already of the forward guidance. Unfortunately, on both sides of the Atlantic, the forward guidance was also linking the, I would say, non-conventional part of the uh, policy of the central bank and the conventional part. Namely, on both sides of the Atlantic, the Fed and the ECB said, we will increase rates only after we have finished, terminated our net purchases of tradable securities. That was something which was said. I can understand that, again, exactly like the forward guidance, we will continue to be accommodating for a long period of time. That was a way to, I would say, organize uh, accommodation for a longer period of time. But the problem was that even after Jay Powell or Christine uh, said, uh, we are not in a transitory situation, the fact that they had linked the interest rate increases to the end of the net purchases of tradable securities created a situation where they had to wait. And I mentioned change of diagnosis November 2021, start of the uh, overall monetary policy decisions, uh, March, uh, March uh, in uh, 2022. So that was the fourth uh, explanation I can give. Uh, there is a five explanation, which is very, very important also for the economist and uh, uh, which I trust is uh, really a problem. Not a problem in normal period where you, you are more or less uh, in a 
some kind of tranquility, even if all decisions that you have to take uh, are very, very important, but a very uh, difficult situation when you have rapid changes, rapid changes in the real economy, rapid changes in the, I would say, inflation. It is the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model. So the, so the model that are generalized, that are informing, I would say, the private sector as well as public authorities and central bank on what, what's likely to happen. I experienced myself how these models were plain wrong when we had the Lehman Brothers crisis because uh, they were suggesting that the economy was slowing down, but not dramatically, when the reality was that it was falling like a stone. So that I realized myself that all our models during the, the three quarters after Lehman Brothers, Lehman Brothers was in September, you might remember, September 2008, and we had last quarter of 2008, and then the first and second quarter, quarter of 2009. The real economy was falling several, uh, several, uh, 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 I am looking at the statistical, the English statistical qualification, écartip, uh, écartip, en, en français, it's écartip, standard deviation, standard deviation, sorry. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> when you are always uh, speaking English uh, from time to time, so standard deviation, several standard deviation for the real economy uh, observed ex post in comparison with the all, I would say, the modeling and the forecast and the projections that were made not only by the ECB, but by all national banks concerned. So to give you an idea of the way we were lost at, the, at that moment, that did not mean that we were not able to take decisions but clearly we were not correctly informed. So that I considered at the time that the only way to be really informed was to gather the uh, persons that were in the real economy and to ask them what they were observing. And it was exactly the same. Jay Powell saying, we, it is transitory. He was saying that because the, his model were suggesting that it was transitory. It was unthinkable that he would have said something which was contrary to the modeling of the uh, staff of the of the uh, Fed and uh, the, uh, I would say, hundreds of PhDs of first quality that were there. But the models were wrong because, because we were in a very special situation, a sp situation where the, uh, I would say, changes, the structural changes were extremely rapid and very difficult to model. So don't, don't forget the fifth uh, reason because it's very important and it's, uh, it's a bias which is shared by the public authorities, uh, by the markets, by the market participants themselves. All are, uh, were sharing this, uh, this uh, I would say, uh, wrong modeling of the situation, which again, as a way of, uh, of consequence, concludes uh, you to be sure that uh, you are asking those that are really in the real economy, those who know what is exactly happening and not only those who think that they can model what is likely to happen. So uh, some concluding remarks, if, if, uh, if I may, uh, to try to do the best out of this uh, uh, complex situation, extremely complex situation. The first remark I would make is that we are living in an environment which is extremely uncertain. And uh, it is true for the public authorities, for the central banks, it's true for all, uh, I would say, economic agents. War in Europe, nothing on this front is reassuring. I would say all information which we were given uh, lately are extremely alarming, obviously. Uh, I don't see many signs of a uh, situation in Asia that uh, would not be alarming. The geostrategic tensions in the rest of the world, we don't speak too much 
of the Middle East. We don't speak too much on Africa, but, but everywhere you see elements of uncertainty, elements of major difficulty. The negative impact on confidence, of course, is extremely important. A second concluding remark is that the risk of financial disruption remains very elevated. Not necessarily in the banks, in the commercial banks, in the investment banks, or in the insurance companies, because they have been under regulation and the rules and regulations since Lehman Brothers that are very, very strong, very important, and uh, uh, that are protecting themselves, I think, from playing the same role as they did in Lehman Brothers, where the most vulnerable uh, segment, if I may, of the financial sphere were the financial banks, the investment banks uh, everywhere in the world, particularly concentrated in New York, of course, and uh, partly, partly in London. But commercial banks also proved extremely vulnerable. And uh, that is not as alarming. But you have all the non-banks. The capital that are under management of non-banks, the world over at the moment I'm speaking, represent 50% of the total global capital. And there we did not create the appropriate, it seems to me, and uh, I think this is largely shared, including by the Financial Stability Board, we don't have there the same efforts made to try to prevent a system, the, I would say, materialization of a systemic risk. So we must have in mind that there is a big risk of financial disruption. It's not exactly the same situation as was the case in the Lehman Brothers, the, the last great financial crisis, but it, it could really be something very uh, grave. And we have to understand also that when I look at the overall indicator, which is the debt outstanding as a proportion of GDP at the global level, for many reasons, we have a much higher debt outstanding, public and private, as a proportion of GDP today in comparison with what we had at the time of Lehman Brothers. And there was no hesitation at the time of Lehman Brothers to consider that this particular indicator of global debt, abnormally elevated, was uh, one of the major causes of the financial disruption. A third point I wanted to mention as a part of the concluding remarks is important also. Uh, there is some contradiction between monetary and fiscal policy at the present moment, particularly in Europe, I have to say. Uh, normally, the central bank, as we see, and the Central Bank of Europe, as well as the others, even if the Central Bank of Europe is a little bit more moderate in terms of uh, level of interest rates, but they are elevating interest rates because they are, I would say, they want and they have to be credible in fighting inflation. Normally, fiscal policies should not combat and contradict what the central banks are doing. So that, as uh, I would say, uh, Christine Lagarde is uh, recommending permanently, the fiscal policies that are uh, designed to combat the price, the elevated price of oil and gas and, and so forth, should be targeted concentrated on the most vulnerable part of the society, the poorest and the most vulnerable, and also uh, designed not to be permanent, but to be transitory, targeted transitory, and uh, uh, hitting, if I may, uh, positively, the uh, part of the population which is in the worst situation. It is not what is being done what has been done in the past, and it's very difficult to get back to that. So there is an implicit contradiction 
between monetary and fiscal policy uh, in 2022, only for you to have that in mind. The uh, non-targeted fiscal support for household was 53% of the support, which was decided in all countries in the euro area. The non-targeted support, fiscal support for firms, because the, the same remark is valid not only for household, but also for companies, 37%. The targeted support for low income household, 10%. So you see, the uh, I would say contradiction is there. A lot of fiscal support for a, a lot of, I would say, entities that are not the poorest and the most vulnerable in society. So this, of course, contradict the uh, central bank position. Same in the U.S. I could I don't have the figure in the U.S., but uh, but uh, it is more or less the same issue. Uh, fourth uh, concluding remark, I mentioned that already, there is a big difference between the US and Europe. The Europeans are very, very badly hit but by what, uh, what's happening in uh, the uh, war in Ukraine. We are much more badly hit than the US are. I already mentioned 8.5 to be compared to 6.5. We will see what is the next figure in the US because that I'm comparing December to January. But, but we will have the US only in a few days. But, uh, but see, you, you, you see the difference. And uh, I mentioned already that uh, uh, we had more or less, more or less the same core inflation. I have to be prudent because the, the methodology are not the same and the, the comparison between the the 5.2 on the one hand and 5.7 on the other hand are not necessarily exactly, uh, I would say, reflecting uh, the, the reality. But the idea, you can retain the idea, is that we have more or less, at the moment I'm speaking, the same order of magnitude. So it is normal in such circumstances that the ECB would consider, in my opinion, that to the extent that they are not responsible, of course, for, for, for the price of oil and commodity. In a way, war in Ukraine and the vulnerability of uh, the euro area to what's happening on our continent is such that part of the job of the ECB is done, if I may, by Putin, by the price of oil and commodity which, which is, and the uh, uh, food. Which, which is taking out of our economy a, a substantial part of what could be devoted to the real economy, which is not the case in the US. So uh, I don't argue in favor personally of the European Central Bank going as rapidly as possible to be equivalent to the US Central Bank. I, I think that it is not necessarily what would be the best way to proceed. Uh, the last decision which were taken, you could see, have reduced the differential between the US and Europe because uh, we did 50 basis points, they did 25. So the, the difference, which was, uh, if I'm not misled before that, a full 2% has been reduced by 25 basis points. It's very likely that the next decision taken in Europe will be again 50 basis points because it's been pre-announced by uh, Christine Lagarde uh, yesterday, when it's very likely that in the US it would be again 25 basis points. So again, reduction of the differential by again. To, uh, an additional 25 basis points. So we'll see how this materializes. I would not be against personally maintaining this differential then after what has been pre-announced is done. By the way, I'm not sure that we they are absolutely right to announce in advance five weeks uh, before or six weeks before exactly what they will do. I was in favor myself of giving signs, but not being 
prisoner of a pre-announced decision. So I used to say my, in my time, my time is the, for me yesterday, for you long time ago, but I used to say, uh, we are in a state of strong vigilance. That would signal to the market, we will increase rates. But I was not saying we will increase rates by 25 or by 50 or whatever. Uh, I consider that we have to remain data depending, taking into account new phenomena that could occur, particularly, I would say, when the environment is extraordinarily uncertain, which, as I said a moment ago, is certainly the case today. So uh, I, I take it that they, they might be better to signal that they don't exclude to increase rates again, and that will depend on what's happening. What I understand is that in, in the governing council in Europe, which uh, is very special because you have many different countries, many different governors, some of them with a real drama, because in some countries, member of the euro area, you have inflation of 15% or 14% or even more, 17. I mean, some countries are so badly hit but what's happening, uh, particularly in terms of oil and gas, and uh, some of the production, they are totally depending on, uh, I would say, foreign uh, imports, so that they, they are really, uh, uh, I would say, convinced that they have to demonstrate that they are speaking for real. And uh, I can understand that this is something which is uh, pushed. You, you might remember before the ECB, was qualified uh, before the COVID as uh, extraordinary accommodating, extraordinary uh, calm and quiet, uh, uh, with uh, some kind of agreement with governments that the governments would never expect any increase of rates coming from the central bank. As you see, the central bank is really independent, is had no, I would say, accord with uh, uh, whatever government concern, that all the fantasy of many economists also, that uh, now we were in a totally different universe. And of course, there was an association between the, the governments and, and the central bank. The central banks were totally depending on governments and so on. I always said, this does not correspond to the reality at all. Don't trust that. You will see when inflation comes back. And inflation came back and we, we see what is happening. But again, whatever the pressure coming from the governing council is, I consider they have to continue to have an overall, overall view and understand why, of course, they are not in the situation of the United States of America. Uh, last point. I have, a, a, I have, a, I have time. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can go, go on for one minute. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> um, so I promised to tell you also why I trust that they will succeed on both sides of the Atlantic and uh, everywhere in the advanced economy or in the other economies that have said that they will, they will deliver again uh, inflation, uh, the, uh, I would say, price stability. So uh, I already mentioned that they all said 2% is our goal, around 2% is our goal, uh, because it, either it's the definition of price stability or it is the, uh, I would say, price targeting, uh, inflation targeting that we are pursuing. I consider that this is really extraordinary. Let me give you my own experience. When I took the helm of the ECB after having been in Banque de France, we were the only central bank mentioning 2% as, I would say, the definition of price stability. We had in mind 2%, but close to 2%. We had to requalify that because some were thinking that 2% would mean 0 to 2 or 1 to 2 because they were reasoning not as we did at the time. Namely, we were not inflation targeter. We were reasoning medium term or medium long term. And uh, we had no particular, uh, I would say, uh, 
interval, no particular uh, range that we would, uh, we would mention. Uh, my own central banks and, uh, in, in France were so close to 2% that the overall, uh, I would say, expectation for inflation for the franc, the French franc, before we merge with the other currency was 1.8. Same in Germany, when you look at the overall expectation. So we had to clarify in 03 that we meant less than two, but close to two. But we were the only one. The, the, the UK came down from the government assigning to the inflation targeters in, in the Bank of England uh, the uh, goal of 2% uh, coming from 2.5. So 2% because at the time the UK was envisaging to join the uh, euro area. The US and Japan were not on that line. And after Lehman Brothers, the US decided to adopt 2% as the goal. And Japan decided to adopt 2% as the goal. And we were in a totally different universe after the US decision in 2012 and the Japanese decision in 2013. All the four central banks I mentioned already, because they had 24 trillion euros or dollars in their balance sheet, all those four central banks that are issuing the currency that are in the basket of the SDR were all defining price stability as around 2% in the medium term. For me, it is one of the major structural change in the international monetary system since the explosion of Bretton Woods. There is a nominal anchor for inflation in the major, I would say, economies, the major central banks. Now, uh, they could have taken pretext of the burst of inflation to say, we will see what is exactly the right and appropriate uh, a target or definition of price stability. It's not that uh, easy. Uh, academia is suggesting that 3% or 4% would be better, could be better. So why not? And they didn't do that. They all said 2%. And Jay Powell repeated two days ago, 2% four times in his exposition in front of the press. So I mentioned that as something which you have to have in mind confirmation of this de facto convergence of major central banks to the same definition of price stability. It seems to me that they have to do the job. Of course, medium term means three years. So it would mean that they have to be around 2% in three years time. And I consider that it is very likely that they will deliver. Of course, also taking into account the uncertainties I have already mentioned. So I will stop there with your permission, David. And uh, now you have the other session. Eh? Okay, so maybe I invite you to come on the other side of the room. And yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. Good. On peut se mettre là. Je vais peut-être me mettre là. Oui. Where are you in the US? Uh, oh, I see. I see. I have a, I have a, a brother-in-law who was professor in Washington University, uh, Missouri, Saint Louis, Missouri, and uh, his son, my nephew, is in Corpus Christi in Texas. Yeah, great place. There's a great. Um, uh, aircraft carrying it. Uh -huh. I think it's like a uh -huh. normal one. I don't remember it saying, but it's a battle. Oh, really? Oh.
Thank you very much. It was was really interesting. And also I take one second to congratulate all the students because as David mentioned, today is our last class of these two years program, the semester of these two year programs. So also nice to be here. Um, so, well, uh, we organize our presentation in the following way. We are trying to draw upon of your remarks of today, but also on the ones you did in the eFreeze Foundation in 2017 and in the SCORE Foundation webinars from late October in 2022. Uh, in order also to develop some key arguments that we will very much like to, to discuss with you. And finally, we know the audience has a lot of questions, so there's going to be a Q&A with the audience. Okay, so meanwhile, these uh, slides issues is being solved. I think we can briefly start with the summary of what uh, you were saying. And that uh, basically uh, we are going to start with stating that in order to understand where we are today, of course, we need to draw back upon the scenario of the 2008 crisis and the aftermath of the crisis, the policy measures undertook there. Uh, and also uh, the policy uh, measures undertook during COVID pandemic that more or less were the preconditions or that set the preconditions for today's scenario. So as you mentioned, uh, after Lehman Brothers uh, default, US and Europe were facing high risk of deflation due to several reasons. On the one hand, uh, weak in productivity progress that was also associated with weak or mild growth. The effects on globalization and low bargaining power, also due to the crisis, which uh, we know has effects in wages and that it lower unit labor costs. Uh, and uh, also um, super important, uh, the persistent long-term interest rate, the low, uh, the persistent low, low long-term interest rate, that uh, it also influenced a very accommodative monetary policy. Uh, and fiscal policy at the same time that contributed also to expansion, expansion of central banks balance sheets, which we know of course uh, can have a uh, high impact in global vulnerabilities. Um, 
and as you mentioned also this increase the 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 rate of indebtedness of uh, different uh, sectors of the economy and render high interdependencies and vulnerabilities between financial sector and non-financial sector of the economy and as you also mentioned, and we want to highlight this, was the role of unconventional monetary policy, not only in 2008 crisis, but also during COVID crisis, meaning that uh, central bank took policies that were going beyond uh, interventions directly in, money, in, in monetary aggregates or in the interest rate, but uh, trying to influence uh, those indicators by uh, by either buying uh buying either sorry either uh buying um purchase tradable securities or as you were also mentioning uh and super important the forward guidance and uh advising in in advance uh what was the was is going to be the interest rate in the future so to anchor expectations and particularly during covid uh uh, sorry, during the 2008 crisis and also partly used during COVID, the allocating liquidity without limits, which is uh, basically guaranteeing that uh, markets are going to be liquid, that enterprises will or banks will have access to liquidity at a fixed rate or the outright monetary transaction that it's by uh, allowing central banks to purchase securities in second markets in general with the objective not only of uh, guaranteeing liquidity, but also guaranteeing intermediation when in times of crisis, of course, these can be, uh, these different channels can be hindered or damaged or are not working so well, um, which is uh, super important. Going or coming back uh, a bit to the future, to the future, to the present, uh, what, is causing inflation or what can be rendered as the causes for inflation in uh, the aftermath of the COVID crisis. On the one hand, we have the cycle effect of the post COVID recovery, either by push, uh, by demand or supply pushes due to uh, a combination of expanding monetary policy and also fiscal monetary policy to tackle uh, COVID crisis and the effects that uh, shutting down uh, and, uh, that the long lockdown uh, had had and the uh, and the supply chain the 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 break in uh, supply chains had had. Uh, we also find uh, that the consequence of these monetary policies and also uh, drawing upon unconventionally monetary policies as a tool to pursue this uh, the accumulation of debt due to the quantity of easing that was done during this period. Uh, the low interest rates, of course, to guarantee access to different financial and non-financial organizations to credit if needed. Nowadays, we find also the structural effect of deglobalization, as you mentioned, and also the reorganization of global value change and the impact that that can have uh, in different countries and regions. A higher bargaining labor power which can in induce uh, higher costs of wages and also, of course, have an effect on prices. And, well, the green transition that not only means uh, the need for investment in new greener technologies, but also the replacement cost of capital that can be uh, nowadays considered obsolete and that this, of course, pressure uh, investment. The lag that you also mentioned on central banks' response in their reaction to uh, inflation, both because uh, there was this general consensus that inflation was low and it was here to stay, and also because uh, the implicit pleasure of policymakers, because we know it's nice having or it's good for the economy in general to have a low inflation rate, and it's hard to uh, leave that. And of course, the impact, and I mentioned that a bit earlier, the impact of fiscal policy, not only monetary policy was accumulative, but also fiscal policy was expansive and accumulative, and this also contributed to debt accumulation. So now this is kind of the framework, and since yesterday, as you mentioned, was the last um, monetary policy decision statement by the ECB, we thought uh, we couldn't not discuss this with, with you and take this opportunity. 
in a nutshell, what uh, they they say is that uh, they are keeping this target of 2%, as you mentioned. They are going to try to deal with inflation by incre decreasing sorry, uh, demand. Uh, to do so, they will increase interest rates 50 basis point now and 50 basis point later in March, and then they will assess and decide what is going to happen, which implies a 3% rate now and then 3.25. Particularly, they are trying to reduce the euro system holdings, that is the amount of debt that is held by the bank due to uh, different quantitative uh, policy measures. And this would not have a direct effect. It would have an effect of, and on investment, yes, but it won't have a direct impact in the effect in the in the offer of, of credit because the thing is they will not reinvest everything that is going to reach maturity in the following month. It's not that they will start selling their assets that they already hold. And finally, something that we find interesting and that we want to highlight also in terms of our discussion is that the unemployment rate in the Eurozone was more or less stable in this a uh, couple of months in 6.6%, but they know that these incre increases in interest rate might hinder uh, employment generation in the future. So drawing our attention on a few indicators that come up from ECB's web page, there we have the, uh, the, the composition, let's say, of uh, the harmonized index of inflation by components for the eurozone. And as you mentioned, and we can also see it there, the two main components that uh, saw the higher prices, uh, fluctuations and increases in the last period were food and beverages and energy, uh, housing, electricity, and uh, gas, among others, energy, let's say, uh, which we understand can be due to uh, the, the consequences of Ukraine war, we also see that over the last uh, two months, as well as you mentioned, inflation has been decreasing. And we also see that the household debt to income ratio is quite high, even though if it's reducing, and that the non-financial corporation debt to ratio, even if reducing over the last period, it's still uh, decreasing. Moreover, we have the graph later, but it seems a bit too much. Uh, we see that the zero of wage over GDP seems to be decreasing, which and that additionally with the great decoupling between productivity and wages also for the Eurozone kind of give us the, the, the impression that rather than gaining uh, an increased labor power, uh, workers are actually reducing their participation and the, and the power they have to participate from uh, the market. So I think that our, our first more or less question, and then uh, Christophe is going to, to go deep in this, is if we consider inflation a regressive tax, uh, tax especially in, in working and in poorer houses because they have less income, less extra income or less tools to protect themselves to inflation, if we consider also that the rise in interest rate will not only can, ha, can affect, and as you mentioned, the relationship in terms of financial risk among different institutions, but at the same time, hinder labor creation in a state where already workers seem to, seems to be having less power barrier and less participation over, over wages, then shouldn't we try to focus more maybe on two core issues that are uh, affecting inflation, which is food and beverages and housing and electricity among others and now i give the floor to this. <clears throat> I'm, I'm sorry because time is limited could you repeat the the last question they, they elaborate on that we will summarize all the questions in the end okay fine <laughs> thank you okay so thank you malena so i want to elaborate more on inflation targeting by monetary policy um so if you um want to elaborate the policy you can ask two questions the first question is is the goal even legitimized and the second one is, um, is the mean you are having, is it suitable and appropriate? So let's talk first about the goal. So um, you were talking about the 2% goal before already. And I think it's quite interesting. And there is a quote by Stieglitz who um, 
who said that there is actually not really economic reason for 2%. I mean, of course, price stability won't be 100% and also cannot be 0% because of the deflationary risk. But he argues that there is not an economic reason why it should be 2% or why it should be 4%. It's, that's like up to institutions. And then there is also some scholars also argue that price stability should not be considered as a goal by itself. Um, but so you should in first um, look about how is it affecting um, like the most vulnerable in our society and not just keep um, uh, fight inflation um, when it actually to, to like any cost. Um, so, and, but like we can agree that of course price stability is nevertheless important. And, but now we come to the question, like how does monetary policy actually um, generate um, price stability or should generate price stability? And um, there's what, one model like which most of us know, it's called the new consensus model and or also like free equations model by Karin Saskic. And you have like these three equations. The first one is the IS curve, which is um, um, giving the, the relation between um, interest rate and uh, an output, then you have the Phillips curve, which is giving the relation between output or unemployment and inflation. And then you have like the last function of the government uh, of the central bank. And from there you derive the, um, the monetary pool uh, in rule, um, which determines the, um, the connection between inflation and interest rate. And um, so, but there are some problems about this. Um, of course, mentioned in literature, I mean, there are the asymmetrical effects, which are well known after the financial crisis, you have the zero lower bound of, um, of the interest rate. And also, as it was um, mentioned by Ku, like if you have a balance sheet recession where like the market actors want to deliberate, um, you, you kind of, and you have like bad expectations, um, it's kind of trying to push in your rope. And then there is also, as we saw in the new consensus model, we need a stable Phillips curve, um, which to kind of, which enables us to do fine tuning. And in their paper, 2022, they kind of showed that we don't really have a stable Phillips curve and it actually were, became very flat and that could be like a problem. Of course, you can still um, every time fight inflation um, by just increasing interest rate, but at some point it could be like you cure the disease by actually killing the patient. Next slide, please. And this is the reason by, why both Keynesians argue that you should try to um, park the real interest rate so, um, equal to the productivity growth. And so that means that the target, the nominal target of central bank should be the um, medium run productivity growth plus inflation. And it would be nice to know your opinion on that after. And so then you were also talking um, or about um, causes of inflation. And um, I think it's um, interesting that Stieglitz, for instance, argued that the main, that the main cause for inflation right now is not um, fiscal policy or too much aggregate demand, but it's actually the shift of the pattern of demand. And it was shown by Weber at all in a paper where they did the input output analysis that it's kind of inflation is due to some bottlenecks which um, spread on the whole um, economy. And, and this is like a, a graph by the Bank of England, how, how like inflation, um, inflation targeting should work. And of course, I mean, it's, it, over, it goes over restricting the aggregate demand and but when we actually have bottlenecks and we need inflate um, interest um, investments that would maybe even increase the bottlenecks, um, especially when we think about the green transition, which will be a high um, pressure on, on, on in, um, inflation in the following decades. Maybe um, we we actually need more um, investments to to overcome this um, inflation pressure, not uh, higher interest rates. And so I wanted to argue and ask you about your opinion, what you think about um, 
like expansionary fiscal fiscal policy to actually fight inflation um, was said by Hansen already in 1947 that expansionary fiscal policy can be anti-inflationary um, if it's like invested into productivities and to decrease bottlenecks and yeah it was also shown like by Weber this paper and then of course we have the problem of high debt to GDP like uh, yeah we would like of course increase our, our debt level um and but it's also questioned like there was this famous paper of Reinhard and Rohrhoff that high GDP would actually harm the economy but this is questioned by a lot of people and also the question is if you want to decrease this ratio um wouldn't it also be possible to increase GDP and not do austerity policy which would decrease the GDP and therefore the, the ratio would maybe stay the same and then I wanted to ask you what you think about because of course this you cannot do in the in the framework of the European Union and so I wanted to ask you what you think about these um proposals to to um connect like the the monetary policy of the EU with some sort of European um, fiscal union. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> so my topic will be climate finance, also because the paper we received from you and also your talk was about unconventional monetary policy, and especially since Christine Lagarde um, took over the, the ECB as president, there has been a lot of talk around climate finance. There has been a lot of talk around climate finance in the ECB. So what is climate finance? Is this, uh, is this for the room as well? So what is climate finance? Okay, this is how the UNFCCC describes it. So that's local, national, or transnational financing drawn from public, private, and alternative sources of financing that seeks to support mitigation adaptation actions that will address climate change. So far, so good, but what does this look like in practice? So there are a few levers, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, but we've got obviously fiscal policy, monetary policy, some mixed approaches, and uh, private funding. Now, obviously here I will focus on monetary policy, especially the unconventional policies that have been put forward or developed uh, in response to the climate crisis. Uh, this is from a paper by Beret Al that analyzes um, different approaches to climate finance and, and green uh, green investments. And uh, what is quite interesting, I think, and I don't want to go too much in depth because we don't have much time left and I don't want to become too theoretical, but what is interesting is that they differentiate between policy motives, policy instruments and implementing authorities. And uh, especially the distinction between promotional and prudential policy motives is quite interesting. Promotional policy motives being those that um, seek to mitigate climate change because climate change in itself is seen as a threat to the economy as a whole and as a thing to be um, acting against, whilst prudential policy motives go more into the direction uh, where the concern is uh, financial stability um, and thus, let's say, the exposure of balance sheets of financial institutions towards risks associated with climate change. Um, now, I don't know how much time we have, but I don't think much, right? Four minutes. Okay, then I'll I'll skip this part. But so there's different policy instruments as well, and then political and delegated authorities. Delegated authorities being central banks, for example, in countries where they are independent, like the eurozone. So there are two uh, main approaches then, um, which are the risk exposure approach and the systemic risk approach. So the risk exposure approach relies to this uh, prudential policy motive. And again, I will not go into the details, but we can say that here the main concern is the exposure to risks of the financial sector, transitional risks, which are associated with an unordinarily or uh, a very fast uh, transition to a low carbon economy and then financial uh, stability risks more generally um, related to extreme weather events that can disrupt the financial system. On the other side, we have maybe a more holistic um, point of view, which is the systemic risk approach uh, that claims that climate change exceeds uh, financial stability concerns and thus central banks should be much more proactive in this regard in favor uh, of this discussion uh, i have here a few um, people um, and what is i think the most important thing here is that uh, climate change is seen as something that goes beyond financial stability concerns threatens the whole economy 
and it is important to have an alignment between fiscal policy and monetary policy. By no means do uh, these authors claim that this is the sole uh, responsibility of monetary policy, but they say that monetary policy has a very important role to play, and uh, in big um, central banks should take a much more proactive stance on this. And what is interesting is that even uh, central banks have started to adopt not necessarily this view, but a much more uh, proactive view towards climate change. You have the foundation of um, the, the NGFS, um, the Network for Greening the Financial System in 2017, of which the ECB is part, uh, the Banque de, Banque de France is part. Um, and you have the Bank of England that actually received an explicit environmental mandate in 2021. You have the Bank of International Settlements that explicitly refers to green swan scenarios, which are like black swans. Um, so a very disruptive event, but in this case, they can disrupt the, the financial system, but in this case, due to an environmental uh, ecological crisis. Now, you have obviously have people that are not in favor of this. And again, without going into too much detail, the main argument here is that this is not inscribed in the mandates of central banks. Uh, that the main responsibility lies with governments and that this would expose um, central banks to a political feud into a political sphere that would put their independence at risk. Then there are other concerns like um, people saying that, for example, green quantitative easing, which we will come to in a minute, is not as effective as a fiscal policy. But again, um, people arguing for this are not saying that this should be the only policy. Now, recent developments at the ECB, especially after um, a press release in July last year, was that uh, the ECB has started in October 2022 to implement a green quantitative easing program where they are tilting their repurchases of their corporate uh, bond uh, purchase program towards companies that have uh, a higher climate score. Um, that meaning that they, they look at the emissions of companies and uh, if they have decreasing emissions over a certain period of time, and if their emissions are projected to decrease, those will be uh, the, the, the bonds of those companies will be those that they will repurchase um, in the future. The other three options here, which I will not go into because we don't have time, but they have not been implemented yet. Um, so what is quite interesting at the moment is the green quantitative easing. Now, those approaches have been critiqued. And um, with regards to the green quantitative easing, one interesting critique also because Isabel Schnabel, who is uh, also in the executive board of the ECB, has agreed with this, with this critique a few days ago, was that uh, the green QE program of the ECB only tackles repurchases of uh, the quantitative easing program, which means that they will wait for the maturity of carbon intensive uh, bonds to end before they uh, buy uh, more climate friendly bonds, which given the, the necessity to act very swiftly in light of the climate crisis is highly criticized. Um, the second criteria, critique was that um, only greenhouse gas emissions are considered no other uh, factors that could influence ecological sustainability. The third very important critique is that there's no consideration for the activity of companies. So if uh, let's say, um, a petrol extracting company would decrease their emissions in their activity, in, in, in what they're doing in extracting petrol, that would be in favor for them because they decrease their emissions, but their main activity is still extracting petrol, which still fuels um, a carbon intensive industry. The market neutrality aspect, we might not have the time to go into this, but um, it will be interesting maybe to talk about it afterwards. What has been proposed instead was to uh, include considerations of the activities uh, that companies engage with and uh, exclude high carbon assets uh, right away. And maybe we'll go to the questions because... So maybe also for time concerns, we will ask like the three questions and maybe you can take 10 minutes more or less to try to answer and then we can open the floor for the rest of the students. Uh, so inflation targeting programs to reduce rather than to sustain inflation rate have proven to fail in some countries, for example, Argentina, where I'm from. Uh, but I mean, that's a different, whole different scenario. 
but they do generate high uh, macroeconomic costs to its population. If the drivers of the European inflation seem to be focused on energy costs and food, shouldn't resources and effort be allocated in expanding, solving those bottlenecks that are than increasing interest rates that can further damage those sectors as well as the working class that it's also the more affected by inflation? Yeah, and so my questions would be, so first of all, what would you think about this approach that you park the, to try to park the real interest rate um, by setting normal interest rate equal to the medium run productivity um, plus inflation? Then um, second, I wanted to ask, like we, we, know, we learn in university that the central bank is following this new consensus model approach. And I wanted to ask, is this actually true or like what, what is the actual like what what models do you have to to determine um the, the your your actions and the third one would be like what what do you think about like this fiscal policy approach um should there be um should yeah should there be like a, a european fiscal union or something like that maybe i will ask the first one and then we can see if we have time because i don't I'm want to take time away from the others. <laughs> <laughs> um maybe one question would be my question would be where you stand on the systemic versus uh, risk exposure approach so should central banks consider uh, include climate change considerations for the sole purpose uh, of um, climate related financial risk concerns or should they be more proactive and also actively contribute to fiscal efforts to decarbonize the uh, a country's economy, or in the case of the ECB, the Eurozone's economy. And um, since your talk that we were given in um, October 2022, the, the topic was unconventional monetary policy, and it is precisely in October that the green quantitative easing uh, was implemented. I wanted to hear why you decided not to mention it or what your thoughts were on it in general. Why I did not mention what? The green quantitative easing program oh, yeah. in the, the talk in, in October. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Marvel. Can we stay in the down? We can we can even stay there if we want, but moderate. Oh, we sit. As I said, uh, you, you have excellent questions, I have to say, and your exposition were very, very telling, if I may. So I will only comment on a few in the 10 minutes I have. And uh, I'm sorry if it is not exactly what uh, you consider the most important one, but I could uh, certainly respond also to other questions. There is a dialogue, I understand. So I give me exactly, David, the 10 minutes uh, you, you were kind enough <laughs> to mention. So um, I pick it uh, in, uh, I would say, a random uh, way. Um, you mentioned the fact that a number of academic uh, and uh, Stiglitz was very often uh, mentioned uh, are considering, but he, he was not the only one, of course, are considering that uh, debt to GDP ratio of standing is not necessarily uh, something which is a very pertinent indicator. Uh, academia can do anything and say anything, and provided it's clever, intelligent and very well argumented, it has to be accepted. Still, of course, you have also the real world. And the real world is hard. The real world tell you that any entity is compared in permanent, permanently with the others, at least in a market-driven economy. So what you say and what you do must be or can be perfect, but if your debt ratio to GDP and the derivatives of this debt ratio to GDP is going in the wrong direction, namely that you're augmenting your debt to GDP in comparison with another country that has a certain level, maybe inferior to yours, and which is going in the wrong, in the other direction, then you can be sure that you are punished in this open system in which we are plunged. The, you're punished only because you have to pay more to get the financing you need. If you don't need any financing, there is no problem. But if you are asking to finance your own economy, then you are at a risk, you are at a disadvantage. So I mentioned that en passant. I could 
tell you that I have run the ECB at a moment where nobody was challenging Greece, Ireland, Portugal, Italy, and Spain, and, and not also Cyprus. But at a certain moment, and the trigger was something totally unpredictable, namely Lehman Brothers, or the subprime and Lehman Brothers, then we had a waking up of the drama, and we had to combat. We won this, uh, this battle, apart from Greece, uh, which, uh, which uh, was a special case, but we won the battle. But again, the, I would say, order of challenging the various uh, signature concern and country concern was exactly the order of their vulnerability as perceived right or wrong by the market and the debt to GDP ratio was very important. So I, I mentioned that all. today, this country, my country, is in between in terms of the price to be paid on the market in between Germany and Spain. Spain is much higher price to pay to finance itself. Italy, even much higher. But you know, all the countries are in a world, again, as long as we are in a market economy global system. Uh, second remark, the 2%. It's absolutely true that the 2% were not driven at all by academia. I cannot find, I can find in academia some uh, article, seminal article that were recommending uh, a single currency for the European, for instance. As you know, there has been seminal article uh, going on in that direction. I don't have the memory of a seminal article saying 2% is good. 2% was the product of a highly pragmatic meditation and action to take into account the fact that uh, the target or the definition of price stability was not uh, likely to be very close to zero because of the risk of deflation and materialization of the deflationary risk. It should not be too high because if, if it is too high, it does not correspond to price stability and you have the difficulty to convince your own people that uh, 3% or even 4%, which was recommended by Stiglitz, I understand, or perhaps, or certainly by Olivier Blanchard and by others, uh, they can have a good reasoning, as I already mentioned, they, they can say it's much better because if we are in a situation of high uh, level of debt, then you are shrinking the real value of the debt thanks to higher inflation. Or you could say uh, in a period of uh, rapid transition to have a higher, I would say, realignment of the various uh, relative prices is better than being in a straight jacket of zero to two of of less of two percent as the objective. I'm sorry, I should not mention the other, but but you, you have you have a, a re realignment, as I said, of the various relative prices. Some are going up, others are going down, and all taken into account. If you if you are four at four percent, perhaps you could have higher level of relative price modification. All this is true. Uh, the I would say at the moment of the crisis, I was myself in discussion with the the chair of the IMF, uh, which, who was uh, at the time uh, Mr. strauss -Kahn. And I was telling strauss you cannot let the IMF suggest that it would be good that we would have a, a definition of price stability or objective of 4% instead of 2 Because do you realize that it would mean immediately that the market participant would say, OK, the hedging against future inflation is now uh, no, uh, not to be, to be designed to hedge again 2%, but to hedge again 4%. And so that means immediate augmentation of medium and long-term interest rates, which is exactly what we should not do in a situation where we are in a dramatic crisis and where, where we try to alleviate all the pressure on the market. So I mentioned that en passant, but what is very important for you to understand, whatever, and the good, again, I, I'm not criticizing the pertinence of all what is said, some were saying also it was not mentioned uh, because it's a, a little bit uh, difficult perhaps uh, to capture, but some were saying 0% is the appropriate price stability. Why the hell are you reflecting on qualifying price stability 2%? No, 0 is better. So in between 4 and 0, say that uh, 2% was the choice, the pragmatic choice after the crisis of the Fed, 
And it was very courageous for the Fed to choose 2% because they had a goal, uh, I mean, a mandate, which is uh, fourfolded, if I'm not uh, mistake, uh, mistaken. Uh, you, you have price stability, you have low long-term interest rates, you have full employment, and you have, no, I mean, uh, the three suffices. The other are associated with the three. So they decided to say price stability is 2% in the medium term. And they did not say what was the definition of full employment. And it was a risk because they depend on the Congress and the Congress could, could have said, you, don't, you cannot define yourself uh, the quantitative uh, target that you have, uh, define both full employment and inflation or none of them and let us judge whether your job is good or not. So I mentioned that en passant, it was a very courageous move by Ben Bernanke at the time, but it was under the pressure of a very highly dramatic uh, situation. Uh, I mentioned, the f uh, labor was mentioned many times. We have to understand much better what's happening in the US, in Europe, on the labor market. It's very difficult to perceive how it's possible that the situation of labor can be so good, apparently, in both on both sides of the Atlantic, when we do not have growth very uh, satisfying. Uh, real growth, when I look at the PMI, for instance, I, I don't see where the growth is, neither in the US uh, nor in Europe. So consumption is still very dynamic in the US, but how can you have uh, uh, real growth, manufacturing, uh, I would say, production or service production, which is disappointing and contracting with uh, those very good uh, results as regards employment, I don't know, and and I, I expect uh, academia to explain us what, what is happening. Apparently, there is a shrinking of productivity, uh, labor productivity, which is uh, very rapid. Uh, after COVID on both sides of the Atlantic, that's, that's difficult to, to understand. Uh, other uh, remarks, inflation is not only uh, taxation on those who cannot protect themselves very, very well against inflation. And if you say the most vulnerable, you, you're right, of course, that goes without saying. Those who are in a better situation, the uh, uh, people that have all the way to hedge against inflation are in a better situation. I draw your attention to the fact that in all our society now, you have also people that are totally out of society, that, that are not perceiving a wage, uh, wages and salaries even not necessarily associated closely to the social safety net. Uh, in the US, it's very visible, of course, but also more and more in Europe. Those are killed by inflation because they, they have no protection. Uh, well, they cannot utilize protection. So I, I draw your attention to, to that point and also to the fact that you have to be aware a little bit on having always the same bias. Uh, that's another story. But for instance, when interest rates are going higher, it's very bad. And the bias is you are uh, killing the poor. When interest rates are going down, it's uh, you are enriching the rich. Uh, you are never balancing that. I mean, it's true that when interest rates are going higher, normally it makes the rich less rich. And uh, th that should be said from time to time in order to understand that uh, uh, there is no, not only one way bet uh, in all what is being done by the central banks uh, to, to mention them. Another point uh, also, of course, uh, uh, on the models that you mentioned, and I think that the, your exposition were very good, by the way, I, I congratulate you for, for uh, what has been done in terms of uh, approaching the most modern uh, new consensus model uh, in particular, uh, I, I draw your attention on the fact that the practically the anchoring of expectations appears right or wrong to the central bankers as something which is absolutely essential, anchoring expectations. That's why we are so attached to preserving the 2%. Why Jay Powell said 2%, why Christine said 
this idea is if you disanchor expectations, you have the sentiment that then anything is possible. And you know by experience that indeed anything is possible because, because uh, any recommendation that comes from academia can go in any direction. And so you, you don't know where to go. So the, this idea that we are anchor of stability in a world and in a universe which is more and more hectic, unpredictable, uncertain than ever. And that was the, I would say, uh, wake up call of the US in particular with the, uh, I would say, uh, sequence uh, subprime Lehman uh, at a time where the US considered, I mean, the mainstream, the conventional wisdom was we are in the best of the world possible. They call that the Goldilocks. You know, you have everything is perfect. It is uh, some kind of uh, permanent uh, uh, good behavior of markets. We have growth with a very low, uh, I would say, volatility. We have inflation with a very low volatility. We are in the best of the world possible. So again, it is in this environment of con conventional wisdom that everything was perfect that uh, there was the explosion of Lehman Brothers and uh, that the central banks, including the US, considered that anchoring expectations was more important than ever. So on, on climate, I will only say one word. I, will, I am myself involved in the climate business, if I may, because I chair a small group, international, uh, with a Chinese, uh, Indian, uh, US uh, and uh, uh, Mexican, uh, and we are advising the IFRS on the new International Standard Setting Board, which is something was not mentioned, uh, rightly so, because you concentrate on central bank, but it is for the entire world, uh, comes out of the Glasgow meeting, the COP Glasgow meeting, and is uh, chaired by uh, the former uh, chair of uh, Danone, uh, Emmanuel Faber. And uh, it's supposed to give the standards for sustainable uh, standards uh, the world over for the entire world. Uh, and uh, I would say in this respect, I would consider central banks as being part of the entire world. And I expect them to behave at least as a normal, I would say, best uh, a corporate uh, business possible or best entity, public or private, uh, in the world. And so I'm not at all in the camp of those who say central banks should concentrate only on price stability. They have no other behavior that would be recommended. It, do it doesn't seem to be correct to say that. That being said, it is also true that the treaty counts and the treaty says uh, provided price stability is ensured, the central bank should support all the policies of the European Union. And amongst the policy of the European Union, you have, of course, the uh, policy of, uh, of uh, environment. Uh, and the European Union is uh, one of the leaders, of course, in the world in comparison with the US. For the US only, and I conclude on that, the poor Jay Powell cannot follow the path of the central bank, of practically all, all other central banks for a simple reason. He has no consensus in the US. The Democrats are very pro-green and the Republicans, to my knowledge, are anti-green at the present moment. So it's impossible for Jay Powell to work out any kind of uh, political consensus. In Europe, it's very easy for Christine because we have a consensus on the green transition. Maybe it's complicated, maybe we disagree on the, this and that, but at least the direction is accepted by all and by the European Union as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Tricia. My name is Mohamed. I am from Mauritania. And my question uh, is a little bit historical, is to try to put the historical perspective. 
into the current news. Because if we go back a little bit, we see that during the Bretton Woods era, the, the dollar was the de jure global reserve currency. And after the Bretton Woods era, it was the, the de facto global reserve currency. And that reality after the Bretton Woods era was, uh, was in extent because in, in, in a large extent due to the large US defi uh, commercial deficits. And so my question is that given the Biden administration policy uh, outlined in the IRA bill that was out just a few months ago and the desire to reduce the commercial deficits and build an industrial base, uh, what do you think the effect of those policies on the global dollar market and by extension on the euro area and secondly, what do you think uh, a possible response from the European Union would affect monetary policy by the ECB? Um, hi, I'm Otto. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, Otto, Otto from Finland. Yes, from Finland. Yeah, um, and thank you to my colleagues. Um, so in your paper, you discuss the reasons that the financial crisis happened. And yeah, to me, they seem valid, but I would like to add one thing. I think income inequality played a huge role in the US for why the financial crisis happened because, because you had stagnating real wages since the 80s, early 80s. Um, that gave, or that kind of stimulated the demand for credits and also wealth-based uh, consumption because yeah, households were um, taking larger and larger mortgages in order to finance consumption. And in this regard, um, if if income inequality, like low income inequality, is one of the conditions for having a stable economy, how would you, like, how would the consolidated government um, try to acquire or reach that point of having low uh, in income inequality? Um, and then my second question, uh, which is the last one, I would like to emphasize what Chris said about uh, the new consensus model. So if there's no downward sloping IS curve or downward sloping Phillips curve, as it seems to be a bit, um, how it, then it means that the central bank cannot reach or cannot do fine tuning uh, by changing the interest rates, especially, yeah, actually both ways. Um, so Chris mentioned having active fiscal policy, but another way would be to have also active tax policy. So if you have profit driven uh, inflation, as it seems to be in the US at this point, at least in my opinion, you could have a higher tax rates on profits. What do you think about this kind of a policy to tackle inflation? Uh, hi, I'm Felix from Germany, and I would like to come back to the issue of um, climate financing a little bit. Um, considering the long, um, very low inflationary period that we had in the previous decade, um, I was wondering if you would agree that the European Central Bank basically dropped a little bit the ball on that topic, considering the well-documented carbon bias of the ECB's portfolio, um, and therefore has been contributing to undermining the, um, the climate policy actually of the member states. The climate policy of the member states a little bit in the previous decade. Um, and since you agreed that the European Central Bank should become active in climate policy to a certain degree, I would be really curious to hear what um, kind of policy and instruments you would seem as reasonable in that area. Did you take all the questions in time? I'm not... Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I wanted to talk about the non-conventional policies. For many economists, it was a shift in the ECB mandate because in a way, the it's not anymore independent from the state because you purchase the bond, the, the public uh, bonds. And I wanted to know if we can further this um, um, this phenomenon and have a green investment through national debt. Like if the national debt owned by ECB can be cancelled in a way for green investment because there's 2.5 trillion uh, uh, owned by the ECB in terms of national debt. Uh, the France, the German, German, like all the bonds purchased by, by the ECB. Like I mentioned for all the- Yes, 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 yeah. yes. Okay, okay, fine. And if, if it was possible to cancel this debt for green investment in a way, because for instance, the, um, the Bank for International Settlements uh, said in 2013 that it's possible for a central bank to have uh, negative reserves uh, because he can print, uh, it can basically print money. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, got the point. Could you tell me where you come from? Mathieu France. France. Okay, okay. So maybe uh, we take all the questions and just put them back. Okay. <laughs> Hello, thank you. I'm Kalina from Macedonia. Um, I have a question on green transition. You mentioned it as the third secular reason for the growth and inflation right now. Um, so relating to that, um, if we agree that there cannot be, that the ecological transition cannot thrive in a high inflation period, and if we also agree that the current monetary policy is tight, tightening, tightening of the monetary policy is slowing down the pace of decarbonization and slowing down the pace of the ecological transition, um, and even going to a point of um, climate inflation or fossil inflation, which was also mentioned by some ECB members on the talk in Stockholm in January, how do you how do you personally see the ECB's role? in mitigating between the current inflation crisis without blocking the process, the progress of the ecological transition happening. Hello, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm Simeon from France. And you mentioned a lot of the external shocks and their impact on inflation, but actually you didn't talk a lot about the failures, the internal failures of the Eurozone. I'm thinking about uh, especially like the unbalance of the targets to uh, balances. And uh, I would like to know your opinion uh, about these internal failures of the Eurozone. Thank you very much uh, for being here with us debating. I'm João from Brazil. Um, I liked when you discussed the secular and the cyclical um, challenges we're going through right now. I wanted to first ask you about one um, secular, uh, I think, there is a, at least medium run. A lot of people debate asset price inflation. Do you think the quantitative easing and the unconventional uh, asset purchases you did during the um, crisis of 2008 led to asset price inflation? And if that still plays a role today? And second, maybe more uh, cyclical and hot question, uh, if you think, hot topic question, if you think uh, Europe is gonna go into recession, uh, ECB is start, uh, has a prediction of 0.5% uh, growth of GDP. Do you think that's optimistic? Uh, is it uh, probably what's going to happen? Yeah. Uh, so I'm Teofil. No worries. So I'm the US citizen. I'm, yes, but <laughs> yeah. French too. So my name is Teofil. Okay. Um, my question is similar to, to my comrade, uh, and it's about the euro. Uh, you had an essential role to play in the creation of the euro. In retrospect, what flaws uh, does the euro have? Uh, what could you, as a community, have done in uh, in the creation of the euro to prevent all the numerous crises we've had? Hello, my name is Marla. I'm from Germany. And I have a question on uh, macroeconomic forecasting. So you were mentioning the failure of hello, uh, of models that have been used, uh, for example, to predict the consequences of the Lehman crisis. So I am wondering, what is your opinion on other modeling approaches, such as macroeconometric models or stock flow consistent models, to which we have been introduced in some courses, um, that implicitly or explicitly take into account issues such as um, the endogeneity of money creation, or also radical uncertainty that impacts the behavior of agents. Thank you. Hello, thanks for the presentation. I'm Juan Manuel from Argentina. Um, you, you said that the surge in inflation in the US was mainly a demand shock after um, extremely expensive fiscal policies and also accumulating on what Trump did. But now, although inflation is still high, uh, it seems to start to ease. For example, in December, uh, the monthly inflation was negative 0.1%. And there is a record low unemployment also. So I wanted to ask you, how would you explain this in a demand uh, push inflation framework? And uh, if you think it's the work of the Fed raising the rates, or if it could be the ease of the supply shock, for example, that now gas prices around the world are starting to go down and China is also opening its economy. Thank you. Okay, so 
it is, uh, I would say in English, you would say heavy pounding of question. Right? <laughs> so, uh, there are many questions that are turning or swirling around the uh, same issues. Uh, I would, uh, I would uh, try to respond to the last one or next to last. Uh, what would you, what would you consider failure of the EO? What should have been done? So, I don't consider that the euro is a failure as a setting up of a new currency. It's an incredible success, certainly incredible success when you compare the uh, promise which were uh, uh, made to our people to the various countries of Europe, the promise that the new currency would be at least as solid and uh, uh, I would say uh, uh, price stability and stability oriented as the other national currencies. That promise, which was made also to the Dutch and to the German and to, uh, to uh, many countries that uh, were at a high level of credibility, including France, I was myself uh, uh, at the same level, I would say, of uh, the price stability and the, the best currency in uh, in Europe, Dutch Mark and Gilde. So that promise was fulfilled. Nobody trusted at the time that it would be possible. Nobody in New York, nobody in London, and I have to say only a few in continental Europe. So that that's for one. Second, of course, we had crisis, but I draw your attention to the fact that in all cases, these were global crises. We did not invent ourselves in Europe, the uh, so-called, uh, I would say, uh, mortgages uh, crisis in the US. Lehman Brothers was not a European bank. There is no equivalent of, the, of Lehman Brothers in Europe because we take care of that. And we had, that. that is absolutely true, the sovereign risk crisis of some European countries, I mentioned them, namely five, and then if you count uh, Cyprus, six. And we resisted this crisis, obviously. We resisted this crisis. We resisted also the COVID crisis. So beware of a usual way of presenting everything that happens in Europe as bad, and uh, uh, everything that happens in other <laughs> Uh, economy, including the US, as good. I'm sorry to say that to the US citizen amongst us, but we are on this in the same basket. We have all problems. We have all difficulties. The big difference is that we do not have a federal, a political association of a federal nature, of, or even a confederal nature. The US is a full-fledged political federation. That makes an immense difference. The US has a diplomacy, which is a single diplomacy, an army, which is a single army, a geostrategic posture, which is a single geostrategic posture. It's not our case. By our own will, we didn't want to go that far and to have a political federation. That makes also a difference for the euro vis-a-vis -vis the dollar, because the dollar is not very, I would say, overwhelmingly uh, important because of the currency itself. The dollar is very important because the treasuries in dollar are a fantastic market, much more profound and liquid in New York than any current any treasury market in Europe. Uh, the treasury market of the Bund, German, or of the OAT, French, or of the Lira, of the, the, the I'm sorry, of the Italian uh, bonds are. 20 times less liquid and deep as is in New York, the treasury market. So that makes a difference. And the reason why we represent only one third of the overall uh, market share, if I may, of reserves, assets, or of uh, bonds, international bonds all over the world is only because we don't have the same liquidity and the same death which is absolutely normal. We are not a political federation. At this stage, I would only mention two things which I think could have been done, should have been done perhaps, and that I recommended publicly myself. 
Uh, one was the fact that it seems to me that we should have a minister of economy for the euro area. We have a chair of the euro group, the, the group of the ministers of finance. And of course, we have the heads that can meet with, uh, with uh, their counterpart and appoint, for instance, the central bank governor. But we do not have an independent mind that is minister of economy of Europe, of the euro area, and not minister of in his own country. The, the chair of the euro group is a minister in his own country. So he's not fully independent. He has in mind his own problem and the problem of the euro area. I strongly recommended when I was given in particular the uh, Karl der Grosse uh, prize, I recommended that, Charlemagne, I recommended that. Another recommendation I made was it, when, when you have a very difficult problem, the Greek problem being an emblematic illustration of this very difficult problem, uh, the last word should be given at the European Parliament. The European Parliament should be able to say the Greek government does not want to apply this program, he's right. Or the Greek uh, government does not want to apply this program, he's wrong. Uh, it seems to me that the representative of the people of the European citizens, of the Euro area citizens, should have this uh, responsibility. Uh, so that would reinforce the executive part of the Euro area and the legislative part of the Euro area. It seems to me that it would be a, a balanced way of addressing, uh, I would say, weaknesses, as long as we do not have a political federation. On climate, I would again say that uh, for me, uh, you cannot expect all central banks to have the same position. It depends entirely on the consensus uh, which exists in the various countries. I would insist on the fact that in any case, the main, uh, I would say, treaty responsibility of the central bank is not environment. The main treaty responsibility of the central bank is price stability. And it will be judged on price stability. And there is no point in mentioning that Unfortunately, we did not reach price stability because we were pursuing the goal uh, of uh, climate. That's not even thinkable. So I would expect that the central bank would behave as a good, I would say, citizen in its environment. I mentioned already that we will have sustainable standards. At the present moment, we are inventing uh, permanently. And uh, I would agree with many of you to say we don't know whether the uh, judgment of the various uh, rating agencies on whether or not that particular bond is good or, or not. I mean, as you know, there is a lot also of green uh, washing, uh, a lot of things that are uh, very doubtful, and a lot of money which is uh, involved and so forth. And beware also, in my opinion, of too blunt way of looking at it, saying, uh, their policy of the ECB is very bad because they don't eliminate all the oil producer, all the gas producer, and so forth. Reflect the problem is the transition. If we were stupid enough to say not a single investment, it is more or less you know, one of the reasons why we have problems, not a single investment anymore in the transition period in the fossil uh, energy, then we probably would see a price skyrocketing, uh, a lot of catching up uh, ridiculously against uh, the long-term goal. What we need is an established concept of transition that would be reasonable and won't put us in a dramatic situation. Uh, all that being said, I draw your attention to the fact that if we have wars, we are in the worst possible situation in terms of climate, it's abominable. So again, there we have also multi, multiple dimension. And uh, the fact that uh, uh, the tanks that we are delivering and uh, the, the thousands of tanks that Putin is mobilizing are a, a dramatic consumer of, uh, of, of petrol, of, uh, of oil. I mean, it's, it's terrible. It's te absolutely terrible what goes with the war. And of course, uh, if we say it's anti-climate, you should stop the war, it is not necessarily convincing for Mr. Putin, it seems to me. Uh, 
uh, other uh, very important remark on inequality. Inequality is really a political problem. When the spontaneously the economy creates inequality, and that's absolutely clear that uh, the evolution, the spontaneous evolution of the economy is uh, giving a premium for those who have very good educations, uh, for those who are particularly skilled in uh, some, I would say, new technologies and high tech and so forth. So that that is a spontaneous move of the economy. Uh, it, if it creates uh, very abnormal uh, uh, inequalities, it has to be corrected by the state. And uh, a political democracy is there to capture the, the fact that there is something very abnormal which is, uh, which is produced spontaneously by our economy and uh, that the political sphere should not hesitate to combat that. And so we will see whether it is done, but uh, there is now very fortunately a sword in the back of the political sphere, it seems to me. At least it is my own understanding of what has happened and what uh, will happen in the next period of time. Uh, what, what else? Uh, I'm sorry, because of course I will let uh, many of you frustrated uh, from, uh, I think I responded to the US citizen. I think I responded, uh, the French citizen, <laughs> the, the cancellation of debt. I mean, it is terrible to imagine that. I mean, it's, it's uh, first of all, it's impossible, full stop. You will never have the consensus or the vote of the uh, fellow citizens uh, and the fellow governments and the fellow governors of Europe to do that first. So you have to know that. Unfortunately, uh, from time to time, uh, it's difficult uh, in my own country because, because it come, it's very uh, vivid in this country in particular. And you have, again, many economists that have a, a very imaginative way of doing that. Second, you impoverishing your own country, of course, because you own the central bank, you own the system, you own not only your part as French and as uh, country X of the ECB, but you also own your national central bank. And it is your national central bank, which has a lot of this, uh, because the system is totally deconcentrated, totally decentralized. So the idea is a, a pure writing operation you are impover impoverishing you, and you are saying, and they would say, if it was accepted by all Europeans, we, we would say the, the rest of the world, you know, uh, uh, the ECB is not credible at all because we are able to reduce its capital to zero and then to negative and then uh, very highly negative. So that's, that's uh, on the quality of the currency and we rely very much on the fact that the euro is considered a credible currency the world over. It would also suggest that the European have in mind that whatever they are borrow or the euro or the, the European Union or the euro area, whatever they borrow, they have the idea that uh, it is not really to assume their responsibility, but of course to cancel all that. So to to suggest the rest of the world that we are not credible, neither in terms of our treasuries, nor in terms of the currency, it is the best way to proceed. But anything is possible, including the worst, of course. Uh, what can I say? Uh, I'm sorry, again, for those, because I took notes, but <laughs> they are hardly readable, my notes. <laughs> uh, Argentina mentioned mentioned the uh, what did you say, uh, Argentina? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Your inflation is looking to diminish. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, we will see exactly what happens in the U.S. because again, don't look at headline inflation. Look at underlying inflation, core inflation. And uh, from that standpoint, I already mentioned in the US, we were at 5.7 in December. Looked very, look very carefully at what they will produce uh, in January. If uh, 
they produce something which is clearly diminishing, it's a good sign. If uh, it is stagnant, it's a bad sign. In Europe, I have to tell you, we have exactly the same core inflation in December and in January, 5.2. So it doesn't mean that the big diminishing from 9.2 of the headline down to 8.5 is reflected in the underlying inflation. But underlying inflation is very important because it is that underlying inflation which will signal where we will land, if I may, progressively, uh, if we want to go progressively around 2%. So again, we will have the figures in, uh, I guess, in, in a week time. Uh, what else? Uh, we, of course, in terms of, uh, uh, I would say, emotion of the population, reaction of many, certainly of the political sphere, headline is very important. And when you see headline going down, everybody is rejoicing. You know, we are winning against inflation. But clearly, in our case in particular, it is because the price of oil and gas diminished for reasons because it, it went up dramatically and uh, we will see we we are not sure again the war can move in terrible uh, dimension so i i think it's very difficult to predict a, a lot of uh, evolution in this domain uh, i already mentioned climate i'm not sure that i mentioned all all the climate uh, uh, issues uh, uh, the, the, I could see that we, we were in agreement on the fact that the green transition has a cost and that the idea which is generalized to say, and it is the language of the government generally, all governments, uh, at least those who are in favor, but, but Biden says the same as the European, uh, we will produce much uh, uh, goods because of the green transition the cost is minimum. Don't trust that there is a big cost. On the contrary, we will create jobs because of the new te technology, the green, uh, green transition and so forth. My fear is that uh, there will be a cost and uh, we have to understand that. And the, again, we will have to care for the most vulnerable and the most, uh, uh, I would say, uh, poorest part of the population, but, but there is a cost. And the cost is also will also be probably visible in the elimination of the, uh, I would say, savings clot, which uh, was already mentioned, and I, I could see it was also mentioned in the presentation. David, I don't know whether I have still right. some time. Maybe you you know yourself that I, no, <laughs> flibuster. I, I think the debate is not over, but I, the station may, maybe is. I would really want to thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Andrew. You are kindly invited for next year for, for a new cohort and, and, and we'll have the opportunity to continue this debate for those students who want before leaving for the second semester anywhere wants to discuss with me or if you want to stay you can say I can say 20 minutes not more I will uh, thank uh, Jean-Claude again and, and, and so thank you very much. Merci.